Um, let's pray again just as we come to these great words on prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for uh, these words from uh, our Lord Jesus. Thank you that he taught his disciples how to pray, and we pray that this morning uh, he would be indeed, you would be teaching us. In Jesus' name, amen. How's your prayer life? How's your prayer life? Start of a year? A uh, good time to think about these things. In fact, Charlotte, not knowing I was going to be doing this uh, two-week little series, uh, said, said last week, and I noticed that this um, thought and ambition for this year would be her prayerfulness. How's your prayer life? You know, kind of, let's get practical. If you were to kind of scale it, naught to ten. How about us as a church? Okay, to collectively, together, how is our, ch- uh, our prayer life? In my experience, both personal, my myself, and in ministry, if you want to humble someone, asking that question is probably the best way to do it. And indeed, not many things have the potential to make us feel so guilty as talking about prayer. But my strong conviction is that guilt makes for a rubbish motivator when it comes to prayer. And so this morning, I really hope to show us a better way to motivate our prayer lives. Um, uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the preacher, um, said this, You will find that the outstanding characteristic of all the most saintly people the world has ever known has been that they not only spent much, much time in private prayer, but they delighted in it. And so my aim this morning is not simply to increase the amount of time you pray each day. So if you pray for five minutes each day, we're going to double it to ten. If you pray for 15 minutes each day, we're going to add another five minutes, we're going to get to 20, or, and, and so on. Now that may well be, and hopefully will be, an outcome. But my aim is that we would delight in prayer. That our prayer lives, individual and corporate, together would be richer, uh, deeper and fuller because of what we see. Because we're going to learn from the master. We're going to learn from the best. We're going to learn from Jesus. We're going, in a sense, back to basics. This is kind of lesson 101 on prayer. If you have no idea what prayer is, I think this is going to be really, really helpful for you in showing you what what it is at its core. If you're a fairly new Christian and you're not kind of sure what to pray for, if you find you start praying and you very quickly run out of knowing what to say, well, I think this is going to give you help. If you've been a Christian a long, long time, well, it's basic, but it's not boring. These are wonderful and vital and enriching things we're going to see. We're looking at, as Will has already said, at the Lord's Prayer or what is known as the Lord's Prayer. It's probably actually better known as the Disciples' Prayer because Jesus never actually prayed this prayer. This is what he taught his disciples to pray. He comes uh, on the ser- from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is on, literally on a mountain and he's teaching his disciples, uh, surrounded by actually kind of crowds listening in as well. Uh, and he, one thing he picks up here is the, the topic of prayer, and that's why I got Will to read from verse 5. And from verse 5 uh, to the, the prayer itself, we, we learn really two important things for prayer. Firstly, our prayers are not performances to win people's approval. Rather, we're to shut ourselves away, commit to private prayer. Now, that isn't saying that we shouldn't ever pray together or in public. It's saying the importance of the heart attitudes. And of course, when you're by yourself and it's just you and God, well, then there's there's no show for other people. So don't be looking for other people's approval, rather seek God's. Secondly, you don't need to coerce God with kind of long-winded or very eloquent or repetitious babbling. Don't kind of just heap up phrases and, and try and sound really clever and impress God with a number of words. And then Jesus says in verse 9, pray then like this. Pray then like this. Jesus is teaching the uh, the disciples back then and all disciples through the ages how to pray. 
Pray then like this. And I think that word like is a very important one for us. So it's not, no, it's not pray this, and then here are the set words in which you are to pray. The Lord's Prayer, I don't believe, is this formula or set words that we must say by rote. Now, there is nothing wrong with praying it exactly as it's given. In fact, it's good, and we do it as a church. But I don't think that's what Jesus has in mind. It's pray then like this. This is kind of how we are to pray. It's an outline, a pattern or a skeleton that we can then fill in the flesh. Now today we're just going to look at the first half. Next week we're going to look at the second half. Because I want us to spend time digging in to to these lines that our prayer lives would be enriched, that we would be delighting in prayer. And so firstly this morning, the first thing I want us to see is that we are to delight in prayer because of who we pray to. Delight in prayer because of who we pray to. This prayer starts with a call to the God we're praying to. Our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven. That is who we are praying to. And let's think of it in those two parts. Firstly, our Father, then in heaven. So firstly, Father. That is truly remarkable. That we can pray to the creator gods, the sustainer, holy, just, majestic, mighty, powerful God as Father. Father, that is a word of intimate relationship. And let's be clear that it is a a title that only Jesus could rightfully use. Jesus as the eternal Son of God. Jesus as the incarnate Christ. He calls God Father. And yet here, he invites Christians all through the ages that they too can call God Father. Our Father. People who have ignored him. Who have treated him as worthless. Who have rejected his Son whom he sent. And yet how wonderful in those words that we saw in our little Christmas series in in John chapter 1. But to those who did receive him, who did receive Christ, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Those who receive Jesus, who trust and be- or believe, as it says there, in him, believe that actually it was through that rejection that ultimately led him to the cross, led him to dying for, his, uh, for God's children's sins, to bring them adoption into his family. Those who are trusting in that, what we call the God of the universe, Father. Now in a group, even in the room, or, uh, and of course there are many at home, in a group uh, watching this morning, there will be people whose experiences of fathers will not have been good. There will be people who never knew their father or wish they never knew their father. But our Heavenly Father is perfect. These couple of chapters on the Sermon on the Mount talk quite a lot actually of God as Father. Um, in verse 8 we see that there, our Father knows exactly what his children need. In chapter 7, um, verse 11 we see the Father knows how to give good gifts to his children. He is a good Father. And so if you've had bad experiences with your own, well, God is nothing like those bad characteristics. And he is everything that they failed to be. If you had great experiences with your earthly father, well, God is, in a sense, everything that they are and so, so much more. When we come to God in prayer, when we talk to him, that's what prayer is, when we talk to him, whether audibly with words or in our heads, we come to God as Father. What an awesome privilege. What a great God that he would not only allow us to come and speak to him, but actually loves his children to come to speak to him. What a great saviour in Jesus that he would make that possible for us to do so. And it is, of course, only through Jesus that we can pray to him. So if you're not a Christian, and and what I've been talking about this 
calling God Father and talking to him sounds a bit strange to you, but, but also sounds kind of wonderful. Well, the way into this relationship to become his children is by coming to Jesus and trusting him. Trusting him alone for your adoption into God's family. Come to him and you can call God Father. He is our Father. He is our Father in heaven. So if the words our Father is, is stressing our intimacy with God, the closeness of relationship, or the words in heaven, immediately reminds us of God's immensity. You see, heaven is the position of power. It is the place of rule. As Matt even referred to in his prayers, it, God is sovereign. The fact he is in heaven means he is in charge. He's the one who rules. And so our Father in heaven reminds us, yes, not just of the closest and intimacy, but actually of God's greatness, his power, his majesty, his might, his sovereignty, which indeed, of course, makes that intimacy even more remarkable. But, but here, here's, here's the point. Look, it's all well and good having a God that we can speak to. But if he has no power to do anything, well then, so what? You know, it's, it's kind of like bringing your, your money troubles to your six-year-old. You know, that they'll listen, they'll kind of want to help, but, but utterly powerless to do anything. But God is in heaven. He is powerful. He is, uh, as our Father, kind of think of it this way, 100% good, and he is 100% powerful, and therefore he is 100% trustworthy. And we can delight in praying to him. Our Father says to us, you know, maybe just stop for a minute talking on your mobile to people who can't help you and talk to me, your Father in heaven, who can. Our Father in heaven. When we pray, we pray to a Father who loves to hear us. We pray to a Father who knows what we need and we pray to God who is able to act. And that is why prayer is such a privilege. That is why it is such a delight and a joy I don't know, a few years ago now, but whether you saw this on the news, this guy called Robert Kelly, if you recognise the picture or if you don't, didn't see it, um, he took the internet by storm when um, he was being interviewed live on the BBC and his four-year-old daughter, the one in the yellow there, kind of in the middle of this interview, burst in, uh, quickly followed by the little baby in the background and the kind of stroller thing that you could see, um, quickly equally followed by a horrified mother trying, desperately trying to usher them out. But what I thought was actually lovely was, was they, they can't say they took the internet out by storm, they got interviewed and the like. Um, the, the parents said this, they said, we want our children to feel comfortable coming into the room and being able to approach their father. And that means you can't keep that strict boundary where some rooms are off limits. Now obviously there were some limits, because if you did see the video, <laughs> you'd have seen the dad be like, get out. <laughs> um, with God, there are truly no limits. None. There is never a time when God is too busy, too preoccupied for his children. There is never a time when he says enough. We delight in prayer because of who we pray to. And that's how Jesus tells us to start our prayers. We start our prayers remembering who we pray to. And we also, in this line, I think we're encouraged, not just, it's not just a reminder for us, we don't say, oh, our Father in heaven, and that's just all about me. It, there's a, there's a, a note of praise in those words too. So it, our prayers are to start not just by reminding ourselves, but in praising God who he is, praising our Father, that we can call him Father. Praising him for his awesome power and might and majesty. Praising him that we can come to the God of the universe whenever we want and, and bring our prayers and requests like children. But prayer is, is never, never kind of business-like. You know, it's not a kind of, right, here I am, here's my request, stop and I'm done. Now, one person I read this, this week said that every recorded prayer in the Bible starts with a call upon God, kind of some kind of worship. I don't know whether that's true. I certainly, if some that I looked up do. But likewise, we shouldn't be viewing our prayers as these kind of business transactions. 
Actually, they're relational moments. And it starts by this calling to our, our God as Father and praising Him for that. I kind of trained myself uh, to start my prayers with thanksgiving. So almost all my prayers start, Father, thank you. Because years and years ago, I was convicted of my uh, ungratefulness and lack of thanksgiving and, and seeing the importance of thanksgiving in uh, the prayers of, uh, in the New Testament encouraged me to do that. And so sometimes I start, Father, thank you, and I kind of have to pause because I'm like, oh yeah, now I've got to think of something to thank you for. And that, that's kind of deliberate. I, I wanted to, to, de- to develop that. You know, but I also wonder whether I now need to also be training myself to make the start of my prayers worshipful, praiseful. Father, I praise you that. Father, I thank you that. Father, please. Because you know, if I do that, then I will be giving God the praise that he deserves. But I will also be giving confidence to my own requests. So I'm remembering of who he is. And this delights in prayer because of who we're praying to then shows in what we pray for. Because we delight in the, uh, when we delight in God that we're praying to, actually that is reflected in things we pray for. And so our second point here is we delight in prayer, we pray his priorities. I'm just going to get a drink, sorry. So delight in prayer, we pray his priorities. It is completely right that we pray about our our personal concerns uh, and worries. All right, so we looked a few months ago in Philippians 4, uh, wonderful words, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. So God calls us to pray for our personal anxieties and troubles and for ourselves, for our friends, our families. But... If they are the only things we pray about, then our prayer lives are, I want to say, deficient or stunted, limited. Because what is immediately striking about our prayer that, that Jesus teaches here is how long it takes to get praying for ourselves. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us, finally we get there. Well, what kind of surprised me, like, if, if you were to kind of think, right, priorities in prayer, what's the first thing I should pray? I like, think, uh, kind of, surely I've got to be confessing my sins. That's kind of first, I will confess my sins and then I can pray to you. But actually, what, what we see here is that even the sins and our need to confess them is, is not the priority according to Jesus. Jesus' priority, and therefore I think our priority, should be God's and his glory. Because it's not only a matter of order, but it's also um, the, the amount. We get three requests which are about your God, and then we have three requests which is about us. And Jesus says we should prioritize prayers about God and his priorities. So first off, our, um, it says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. I lived with uh, the same uh, three people in both my first two years at university. <coughs> Excuse me, I've had COVID. I am uh, passed out. I'm out the other side and I'm not infectious, but my throat is the one thing that's still struggling, so I'm just going to keep my, my drink in, in the hand. I lived with the same, same three people at university uh, for, the last, uh, for the first two years. And uh, got, what's the saying? Their, their language makes sailors blush. Like, some of their language was, was awful. Uh, and but sometimes, occasionally, they'd, they'd, they'd be sorry, and they'd, oh, well, sorry, Rich, because yeah, they knew I was a Christian. Uh, and as I shared with them, actually, in a sense, it, swearing didn't so much upset me, actually. What upset me more was kind of using Jesus' his name as a swear words. And, and in to credit to them, they did actually try to kind of stop. Now, that is good, but that, that God's name would be hallowed is much more than simply not using Jesus' name as a swear words. Hallowed is a funny word, isn't it? It's, it's one that we don't um, use very much. It's kind of probably the only time 
um, we might use it these days as kind of the hallowed turf. Well, that's the only time I remember it. The hallowed turf of Wembley. What do I mean by that? Well, the hallowed turf, it, it's special. Um, we, we, we set it apart. It's honoured. It's, it's revered. And so when we're praying, hallowed be your name, we're saying, Lord, would your name be revered? Would it be kept special? And God's name isn't simply Jesus, God, the Lord's. It's actually much more than that. It's his person. And so when we pray, hallowed be your name, we're praying that God himself would be honoured and revered. I'm really struggling here. What I'm going to suggest, Will, I'm going to put you on the spot. Would you mind just coming up for a second and just leading us in prayer? <laughs> could, could you just try, kind of take those first few lines? I'm going to take a couple of minutes and then try and sort my throat back out. Thanks, Will. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you um, so much and just praise your name for what we are able to hear from your word, from Jesus' teaching about prayer for this wonderful privilege that we have to come to you in prayer. And we, we just want to praise you and delight in you, Father God. And would you help us to make your priorities our priorities? We um, just want to pray, continue to pray now for our time together this morning and to pray for Rich now as, um, as he struggles with this um, sore throat and the cough. Please, would you work in him now? Would your healing power be at work to enable him to come back and continue preaching from your word to us? And we pray, Father, that you would give us attentive hearts and our ears would hear what you have to preach to us now through, um, through Rich. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Will. Hopefully a lozenger is going to help. I'm all right there. Thank you, Sean. <coughs> I was weighing up whether I should have recorded this in anticipation of this moment, and I didn't, and now I'm regretting it. Hallowed be your name. That God's name would be honoured, revered, respected, who he is. That he would get the glory that he deserves. And do you see how these three requests fit together? If we pray, hallowed be your name, we're reminded very quickly that God's name isn't hallowed. In fact, it won't be and it can't be unless God's kingdom comes. So we pray, hallowed be your name, next your kingdom come. God's kingdom is where Jesus rules as king. And then we see again how that links with your will be done. Because it is as Jesus rules that his will will indeed be done. And so when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, they are, in one sense, missionary prayers. Praying that God's kingdom um, and his rule would come upon this earth more and more in people's lives. It is a prayer of personal holiness for ourselves uh, and our loved ones. It's also a prayer, a kind of uh, end times prayer, looking forward to a time when Jesus will come back and his kingdom will be fully and finally established here on earth. Now those are very, very big prayers. But those are the prayers that, we're, that Jesus encourages us to make. And again, just think about your own prayer life for a second. If you kind of do a pie chart of the things that you pray for, what kind of portion of that prayer life would be on these kind of God priority prayers? These big prayers, these prayers for um, the things uh, that we see here. It's not saying here that we should be praying less about our, our personal and um, small uh, needs and worries and anxieties. It's just praying, he's, Jesus is saying that we should be praying more for these other big things too. 
And I'll say, perhaps at the moment, if you're struggling in your prayer life, it may be because in get kind of getting bored with your prayer life. It may be because your prayers are a little bit boring. And actually to be praying these big God priority things would be a great encouragement and a motivation in your prayer life at the moment. Praying that God would be honoured in our own lives, in the lives of those around us and in those who don't yet know him. Praying uh, that Jesus, uh, Jesus' kingdom would come praying that his will would be done, God's will would be done uh, on this earth. Praying those big things brings some uh, interest and excitement, if I can use those words, back into our prayer lives. As we kind of uh, wrap up here, I just want to offer three practical suggestions um, for our prayer lives. One is be practical. Be practical. Set aside some time when you, <coughs> when you can pray. Have that time set aside, but also be praying regularly throughout the day. Because there's not this, just this transactional moment one time in the day. So set aside time. Use technology if it helps you. There's a great app called Prayer Mate that I'd highly recommend. And that really is just bringing onto technology what people have been doing for centuries, just kind of writing down prayer, prayer notes. Be practical. Secondly, <coughs> excuse me, come to prayer meetings. Here we go. Here's the pastor. Come on, everybody, come to the prayer meeting. But it is great. Uh, if you haven't been, we do four sections, and the last one is praying for each other in small little groups, which is great. But the other three, really has spent praying for these big Godward things, praying his kingdom would come. And then finally, use this prayer as a skeleton for, <coughs> for your own. Pray the line and use it as a springboard for further prayers on that. Our Father in heaven, Father, praise you that we can call you Father, that all the Lord Jesus has done that to bring adopt your children into your family. Praise you for that. Praise you that you are mighty and glorious and wonderful and powerful, and yet I can call you Father. Hallowed be your name. Please, Father, would my colleagues, yes, stop using your names as swear word, but more than that, would they see how wonderful and great you are and come to trust you for themselves. Your kingdom come. Please, Father, again, <coughs> in my own life, in that particular area that I'm battling with, would Jesus rule in that area of my heart? Would your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in my life, in the life of my family, in the the road that I live on, and so on. Take this wonderful prayer and use it as a springboard for your own. Let me close in a prayer. Father, we do rejoice that we can call you Father, the great God's, of the whole universe. Father, we do pray that your name would be hallowed, your kingdom would come, and your will would be done. Amen.